Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Millette with an AP European History presentation. Today's presentation is all about European exploration and expansion as part of Europe's modernization process. One of the major themes of this AP European History course is the interaction that Europeans had with various parts of the world. Prior to 1450, Europeans had established interactions with Arab Muslim and Turkish Muslim peoples in North Africa, Southwest Asia, and Southwest Europe. Europeans had very limited direct interactions with peoples in India, Sub-Sahara Africa, and the Far East. However, after 1450, Europe's interactions with peoples from other parts of the world would increase immensely and really become a major element of Europe's rise to modernity. By the end of this presentation, I want you all to be able to argue the extent to which Europe's age of discovery and exploration impacted everyday life for European peoples. And more formally, you'll be expected to be able to demonstrate your understanding of these six learning objectives. One, explain the technological factors that facilitated European exploration and expansion from 1450 to 1648. Two, explain the motivations for and effects of European exploration and expansion from 1450 to 1648. Three, explain how and why trading networks and colonial expansion affected relations between and among European states. Four, Explain the economic, social, and cultural impact of European colonial expansion and development of trade networks. Five, explain the causes for and the development of the slave trade. And six, explain European commercial and agricultural developments and their social and economic effects from 1450 to 1648. Early modern Europe possessed a unique set of tangibles and intangibles that put them ahead of the game in terms of exploration and discovery. In fact, many European historians argue that this was Europe's initial round of cultural and economic global dominance. In the late Middle Ages, Europeans became wise to Asian technology, such as shipbuilding, navigational instruments, and gunpowder technology. Not too far along after the late Middle Ages was Europe's age of rediscovery with the Renaissance, in which Europeans would become well-versed in ancient Greek and Roman geography, theology, astronomy, and technology. This rediscovery would yield a desire for Europeans to seek out advanced knowledge regarding geography, oceanography, and wind patterns. And it would be these vital pieces of knowledge coupled with Europe's own advancements of certain technologies that became the tangibles of the European age of discovery. Let's first focus on some specific tangibles of the late medieval period and early modern period that definitely enabled Europeans to do the physical things necessary for their leadership in the age of discovery and exploration. Ship design was extremely important for Europeans to navigate the world's oceans throughout the early modern period. And the 15th and 16th century innovations in ship design and construction propelled Europe's seafaring adventures. However, prior to the 15th century, Europe had a history of ship design and construction. For example, dating back to the early medieval period, Scandinavian ships, such as the fairing, gnar, and long ships utilized by the Vikings traverse the North Sea and the Northern Atlantic Ocean centuries before the early modern age of discovery and exploration. As well, Northern European maritime travel, especially in the Baltic Sea, was done mostly on cogs, which were ships that carried the commerce of the Hanseatic League in the late Middle Ages. Additionally, the Italian galley had been a common sailing and rowing ship of the Mediterranean Sea. And immediately prior to the middle of the 15th century, it was the ship that brought Middle Eastern, South Asian, and East Asian goods out of Istanbul and into Southern Europe. These pre-modern ships were terrific in their times and places, but other regions of Europe who were far more isolated from the desirable commercial access points were motivated to engineer innovations in ship design and construction. 
For example, the Portuguese and the Spanish, who were located on the Iberian Peninsula in southwest Europe, had a long history of exclusion from eastern Mediterranean trade. During the 15th century, these nations went to work producing caravel ships. Caravels were smaller, more maneuverable ships that were capable of sailing the Atlantic Ocean. It would be the Portuguese caravels, designed with lateen sails, which were a post-classical Arab invention, that carried the first explorers and cartographers along the West African coast, and eventually carrying explorers like Bartholomew Diaz, who discovered the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa, and Vasco da Gama, who explored the first route to India by sailing around the southern tip of Africa. It would be the Spanish caravels that carried Christopher Columbus and his crews across the Atlantic Ocean on four separate voyages. Caravels and all other European ocean-going vessels would be outfitted with sternpost rudders. A Han Chinese invention, the sternpost rudder enabled greater maneuverability to early modern European ships, as they had done for pre-modern Chinese junks. Once the exploration succeeded in placing Europeans into more direct points of access to markets in Africa, Asia, and the recently discovered Americas, Europeans began to design larger ships that were built to hold large amounts of cargo. Having recognized the cargo-carrying abilities of the dows and junks of the Indian Ocean, Europeans needed larger merchant and cargo ships to reap the benefits of the resources and goods it would access in the early modern period. The Portuguese constructed the Turek with square-rigged sails in order to carry large quantities of spices, gold, salt, pepper, and sugar throughout the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. The Spanish constructed the galleon with both square-rigged sails and a lateen sail in order to carry large quantities of silver across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Dutch constructed the flute with square-rigged sails in order to carry large quantities of luxury goods across the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Navigational instruments and innovations were other tangibles that enabled Europeans to establish their leadership in transoceanic travel. It is to be understood that prior to and during the early modern period, cross-cultural interactions resulted in the diffusion of these navigational instruments which facilitated the changes in the patterns of trade and travel. Europeans who were predominantly recipients of these instruments went to great lengths to capitalize on innovations to these navigational instruments. Prior to 1450, Chinese, Indian, and Muslim seafarers utilized navigational instruments to help them determine their nautical position, the distance between their nautical position and their destination and the expected length of time of their voyage. One instrument, the compass, a Han Chinese invention from classical times, progressed into the post-classical period and enabled seafarers to determine direction. Its use of a magnetized needle meant that direction could be read even when the sun was not visible, as in the case of nighttime navigation or during inclement weather conditions. The compass kept seafarers on the correct path to their destination and enabled them to venture beyond the coastline sea lanes. Another instrument that was capable of determining vital pieces of information regarding a ship's nautical position, its distance from its destination, and its expected length of time of its voyage was the astrolabe, an ancient Greek invention. The astrolabe was diffused to other classical and post-classical societies Eventually used for nautical navigation. Arab Muslim travelers simplified the astrolabe and developed other instruments that could be used for nautical navigation, such as the quadrant and the kamal. Another simplified version of the astrolabe that would be utilized by the Portuguese in the 15th century was the mariner's astrolabe. Europeans took to finding more ways to improve navigational technology for their oceanic travel needs. The cross staff, the back staff, and ultimately in the middle of the 18th century, the sextant were all developed to improve the precision of determining nautical latitude positioning. 
These innovations enabled more Europeans to efficiently and more safely explore oceans and establish new routes to their destinations, and ultimately were contributing factors to Europe's dominance on the oceans. Maps were extremely important in the early modern period, and as another tangible that contributed to Europe's leadership in transoceanic travel, the improvement and precision of maps during this time was most necessary. As the Portuguese, the Spanish, and other exploratory European states got more involved with oceanic navigation, cartography also improved in terms of precision. Going back to classical times, Ptolemy's map of the world was the most accepted map by Hellenistic and Roman societies. Arab Muslim and Roman Catholic intellectuals preserved Ptolemy's geographic and astronomical publications throughout the post-classical period. Although Arab Muslim and Italian cartographers utilized Ptolemy's map as the basis for their own cartography, inaccuracies were found, and late post-classical and early modern peoples began to construct their own maps. In Italy, Italian cartographers produced portalon maps, predominantly ones that emphasized the Mediterranean Sea, since that was the most immediate location the Italians sailed most frequently. However, as nautical and cartographic schools began to open in places like Spain and Portugal, more precise maps of coastal West Africa were constructed. After 1492, as more Europeans sailed west across the Atlantic Ocean and ventured into the Caribbean islands, South America, and North America, the addition of these lands, the size of the oceans, and their spatial precision improved immensely. Gutenberg's printing press helped to disseminate geographic knowledge through more improved and precise cartography, which enabled more and more European states to involve themselves in transoceanic travel. Maps and astronomical charts were not the only forms of produced data of the lands, seas, and skies for seafaring navigators. Another tangible was the recorded information of the wind patterns that Europeans studied as they traversed the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans during the early modern period. Much like Persian, Arab, and Indian sailors learned of the monsoon wind patterns in the Indian Ocean complex, Europeans came to learn and record wind patterns of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. One example of Europeans mastering wind patterns was known as the Portuguese Volta do Mar. Basically, as Portuguese sailors sought to leave from coastal Brazil and head east to Lisbon, Portugal, they discovered the difficulty they had sailing against the northeast trade winds in order to head back home. Those trade winds that blew from the east and enabled Portuguese sailors to swiftly travel west to Brazil would be a nightmare to try and travel against in hopes of reaching Portugal safely and timely. Instead, the Portuguese sailed north into the Caribbean and ultimately into the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, where the wind pattern blew east and the sailors would catch the westerlies. The winds were referred to as the westerlies because they developed in the west, but the wind pattern moved to the east. It was then that Portuguese sailors could more efficiently and safely travel east and back to Lisbon. This sort of wind knowledge eventually led to efficient systems of maritime trade such as the Atlantic Triangular Trade. Wind patterns were important in the Northern Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, and ultimately this recorded knowledge enabled the Portuguese, the Spanish, the English, and other European seafaring states to establish new and efficient routes to direct access points to markets all over the world. Let's understand this about the early modern period. This is really the era where Europe is starting to increase its presence in different parts of the world that it had been secluded from in previous times. In the case of the Americas, yes, Europeans utilized their ocean-going vessels, iron weapons, gunpowder, cavalry, and even diseases to defeat large empires and subjugate entire populations. 
even in the Eastern Hemisphere, typically in the Indian Ocean complex, European use of naval artillery greatly increased their presence and command. Timeliness also had a lot to do with Europe's success with its artillery in the early 16th century. For example, when Portuguese Admiral Afonso de Albuquerque arrived in the Strait of Ormuz near the Persian Gulf in 1507, his seizure of the port came at a time about 10 years prior to the Safavid Empire's transition to gunpowder. In posthumous publications, Afonso's victory at nearby Ormuz, it was emphasized how his fleet was successful due to his use of advanced artillery, to which the Safavids and many of the kingdoms nearby had no answer. Europe had a unique set of intangibles that other regions of the world just did not possess around 1450. A history of relative isolation and exclusion from having direct access to the world's most desirable markets, a growing economic demand for scarce luxury goods, and motivation to gain access to those desirable markets were all the intangibles necessary for European states and their political elites to begin putting their resources behind transoceanic voyaging. In contrast, China recently revoked financial sponsorship for its long-distance merchant and diplomatic oceanic voyages. The early 1400s, under the Ming Emperor Yongle, was a time of great state sponsorship of Zheng He's long-distance maritime voyages into the Indian Ocean Basin. Zheng He's treasure ships took goods and diplomatic gifts to East Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia in the name of demonstrating Ming prosperity and power. But by the 1430s, the Ming emperors had decided to revoke the funding for long-distance voyages. Instead, the tax revenue they collected went to more pressing internal matters, such as extending the Great Wall of China so as to better protect their borderlands from a second invasion by the Mongols. The Ming emperors also began to prioritize the construction of the Forbidden City and necessary defense systems for the city of Beijing, rather than appropriate funding to maritime travel. In essence, were Chinese political elites basically abandoned their pursuits of economic gain from maritime travel, European political elites were eager to financially sponsor risky and dangerous voyages into unknown waters. During the 15th and 16th centuries, European monarchs gained an unprecedented amount of power over the functions of their states. During the Middle Ages, the nobility and the papacy limited monarchical power. However, as states established political entities that oversaw taxation and military development, European monarchs became more powerful than they had ever been over the previous millennia. These so-called new monarchs of the 15th and 16th centuries were willing to financially sponsor long-distance oceanic voyages, finance the construction of large navies, and use those navies to protect newly discovered trade routes and trade posts. One example of a state whose monarchs financially supported maritime travel was Portugal. Located in southwest Europe on the Atlantic coast, and isolated from the Mediterranean Sea, Portugal longed for direct access points to African and Asian markets. King Afonso V, who ruled from 1438 until 1481, financed his uncle's exploratory voyages of the Atlantic Ocean and his establishment of cartographic and navigational schools. Afonso's uncle was Prince Henry the Navigator whose cartographic school at Sagres in southwestern Portugal produced precise maps as explorers made their way down the west coast of Africa. King John II, who reigned from 1481 to 1495, also supported Portuguese exploration by financing Bartholomew Diaz's exploratory voyages to the southern tip of Africa, traversing the Cape of Good Hope. King Manuel I, who reigned from 1495 to 1521, sponsored Vasco da Gama's voyage to India, 
He also helped to outfit Da Gama's fleet with weaponry, so as to establish trade posts in East Africa and South Asia. Manuel also financed Pedro Cabral's voyage to South America, which ultimately enabled the Portuguese to colonize Brazil. Lastly, Manuel also financed Afonso de Albuquerque's naval missions into the Persian Gulf. Afonso de Albuquerque successfully took over the island city of Ormuz in the Persian Gulf after defeating a small Islamic kingdom there. Beyond the Persian Gulf, Afonso de Albuquerque also forcibly established trade posts in India and in Southeast Asia, and in 1511, he took over the city-state of Malacca on the Malay Peninsula and inaugurated Portugal's monopoly on the spice and pepper trade. These monarchs helped to establish Portugal's long-lasting trade post empire in African and Asian lands. A second example of a state whose monarchs financially supported maritime travel was Spain. Having recently ended its religious conflicts with the Moors in the Reconquista and unifying the kingdoms of Aragon, Castile, and Leon, the Catholic Spanish monarchs, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, sought to financially sponsor explorers across the Atlantic Ocean. The most recognizable individual in Europe's age of exploration is Christopher Columbus. Columbus was an Italian merchant and seafarer from the city of Genoa. Ferdinand and Isabella agreed to finance Columbus's four voyages across the Atlantic Ocean. Believing that he could sail west across the Atlantic Ocean and reach the islands of Southeast Asia, Columbus took off as admiral of a small fleet of three Spanish caravels, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Thinking he had made it to the islands near India, Columbus referred to the lands as the Indies. However, he had actually made landfall on the island of Hispaniola, which hosts the current nations of the Dominican Republic and Haiti in the Caribbean Sea. Columbus made three more voyages over the next decade and ultimately became the viceroy of the Indies in Spain's new transoceanic empire and opened up the Western Hemisphere to Spanish colonization. Ferdinand and Isabella were also in power when Spain and Portugal entered naval conflict regarding oceanic routes and land disputes in the Western Hemisphere. Initially, the two nations agreed to a longitude line of demarcation down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Spain was permitted to explore and colonize everything and anything to the west of the line of demarcation, while Portugal was permitted to explore and colonize everything and anything to the east of the line of demarcation. Incidentally, Portuguese ships were notorious for traveling into Spanish waters. In 1494, Pope Alexander VI arbitrated the Treaty of Tordesillas and moved the line of demarcation westward from its initial agreed position. This enabled the Portuguese to venture further west into the Americas and ultimately empowered them to colonize Brazil after 1500. Ferdinand and Isabella also sponsored Florentine navigator Amerigo Vespucci in his voyages to the Western Hemisphere. Vespucci landed in present-day Guyana in 1499, and by 1502 he had declared that Columbus had been wrong in believing that he had landed near India a decade earlier. This prompted Spain to use Amerigo Vespucci as the namesake for the South American continent. Habsburg Emperor and King of Spain Charles V followed Ferdinand and Isabella's precedence in sponsoring oceanic exploration and travel. Charles V sponsored the expeditions of Hernando Cortes to present-day Mexico and Francisco Pizarro to present-day Peru, which ultimately expanded Spain's transoceanic empire. Additionally, Charles V commissioned the Portuguese sailor Ferdinand Magellan to circumnavigate the world. Although Magellan was killed in a skirmish with native Filipinos, his crew ultimately completed the circumnavigation. In a few short decades, the Philippine Islands came under Spanish imperial control during the reign of Spanish King Philip II. Spain's exploration and colonization in the Americas and the Philippines along with its trans-Pacific travel, enabled Spain's control of the global silver trade during the early modern period. Finally, northern European Atlantic-based states 
got involved with transoceanic exploration and colonization. Although Northern European monarchs definitely financially supported exploration, English and Dutch financial sponsorship came from private investors who invested their money into joint stock companies, such as the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company, or the Dutch VOC. Initially, English, Dutch, and French explorers sought a northwest passage to the markets of the Far East. They believed that one could be discovered in the Arctic Circle, and that they would have an advantage over the states closer to the Mid-Atlantic, like Spain and Portugal. Ultimately, those that sailed for the northern European states failed to find that northwest passage, but they did lead to northern European presence in modern-day Canada and the United States. Also, the English, French, and Dutch eventually traveled the same routes as the Portuguese and entered the Indian Ocean complex during the early modern period. In England, Henry VII of the Tudor dynasty, who reigned from 1485 to 1509, financed Venetian explorer John Cabot's voyage to North America at modern-day Newfoundland, Canada. Additionally, Queen Elizabeth I, the last of the Tudor monarchs, who reigned from 1558 until 1603, financed Sir Francis Drake's circumnavigation, the world's second circumnavigation. Elizabeth also financed Walter Raleigh's exploration of the Atlantic coast of North America, which led to the establishment of the first English colony at Roanoke. The French monarchs also financed exploration. For example, King Francis I, who reigned from 1515 to 1547, financed Jacques Cartier to North America, who ultimately founded French Canada. Later, King Henry IV, who reigned from 1589 to 1610, financed Samuel de Champlain's voyages to North America, who ultimately settled Quebec City in French Canada. Ultimately, these Northern European states colonized portions of the Americas, especially North America and involved themselves in the North American fur trade and the commercial production of rice and tobacco. European rivalries played out in North America, and for the French and the English, the rivalry came to a head with the French and Indian War, the North American theater of the Seven Years' War. As much as these Northern European states did not remain isolated from the Eastern Hemisphere, for example, the Dutch would arrive in Southeast Asia by the late 16th century, the French would arrive in India by the late 16th century, and the English would arrive in India by the early 17th century. This array of European nations spawned more political and economic competition, which further drove these nations to explore, colonize, and build transoceanic empires. In fact, English and French rivalry came to a head in the middle of the 18th century with the Seven Years' War, which involved trade and territorial disputes in India. Throughout the early modern period, northern European states and Atlantic-based markets thrived with unprecedented economic prosperity. Atlantic port cities such as London and Bristol in England, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and Antwerp in Belgium were the locations that prospered the most, as the shift of the center of economic power in Europe moved from the Mediterranean and into the Atlantic states of northern Europe. Once established, the maintenance of European trade posts and colonial empires involved economically benefiting from the resources, production, and exploits of expansion and sustaining that benefit over a long period of time. During the early modern period, European transoceanic empires were able to do just that, sustain economic growth over time. One way that European states maintain their trade posts and colonial empires in the interest of economic benefit and wealth accumulation was through the policies and practices of mercantilism. Mercantilism was an economic practice utilized by European states to extract resources, especially precious metals like gold and silver, monopolize trade and markets, and protect national economic interests by raising tariffs so as to increase the state's wealth. Each European state established a system of mercantilism that was in place throughout the duration of the early modern period. Some of those European states 
utilized that system with high levels of economic regulation and high taxation, while other European states utilized the mercantilist system when economic needs arose. Mercantilism also increased the competition between and among European states, as national economies were measured by the amount of gold and silver bullion in a state's treasury. In essence, European states and their political elites sought ways to establish a favorable balance of trade that kept products exporting abroad and gold and silver being imported into the state's treasuries. Mercantilism, especially through joint stock companies, was also utilized by Europeans in their displacement of Indian and Muslim states' roles in pre-existing economic systems, such as the Indian Ocean Complex. Spain, Portugal, and France utilized mercantilist policies more so than the English and Dutch used them during the early modern period. Spain's colonies in the Americas and the Philippines were under the authority of the Spanish monarchy, which made every Spanish colony a royal colony. Since the Spanish monarchy had so much control over colonial production and commerce, its practices of high taxation, trade restrictions, and tariffs were used to ensure that an abundance of bullion made its way into and stayed in the monarchy's treasury. The best example of the application of Spanish mercantilist system was the global silver trade. Spain's colony in South America was also the location of some of the world's largest silver mines. And at its height, Spain controlled 85% of the world's silver. In places like modern-day Peru and Bolivia, silver mining was the priority of the local colonial economy, which complemented Spain's national economic priorities. Ever the mercantilists, Spanish monarchs ascertained 20% of all silver mined in the Americas. The remaining silver traversed the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans to the Asian markets of India, Indonesia, and China. Galleons that were strong enough to carry silver from South America and Mexico traversed the Pacific Ocean en route to Manila in the Spanish Philippines. From Manila, Spanish merchants would exchange silver for Chinese luxury goods, such as porcelain and silk since the Ming Dynasty had transitioned to a silver standard of currency and sought to hoard as much silver as it could. Mercantilism was also utilized in France and in the French colonies of the New World. Jean-Baptiste Colbert was the Minister of Finances under French King Louis XIV. Colbert promoted a type of mercantilism that sought to increase French production and commercial activity protect the French economy by raising tariffs on non-French imports and encouraging foreign manufacturers to settle in France so that France could monopolize fur, linen, glass, and mirror industries. Colbert was also in power during the time of French exploitation of the fur trade in North America, and his mercantilism promoted the movement of more French settlers into North America encouraged more interactions between French settlers and Native Americans, and a drastic increase in the trapping and trading of fur pelts and their distribution to Europe and abroad. Dubbed the soft gold trade, the fur trade brought enormous wealth to France and other participating European empires, such as England and Russia. Russia's expansion into Siberia and Alaska brought enormous wealth to Moscow and the Romanov dynasty thanks to the soft gold trade. The English and the Dutch utilized the systems of mercantilism, but neither state utilized their system to the extent of the Spanish, Portuguese, and French. In essence, many private investors and colonial settlers benefited from the relative lax economic regulations. In the English colonies of North America, a colonial period of salutary neglect characterized the late 17th and early 18th centuries. In essence, the English government extracted minimal taxes and enacted minimal trade regulations and restrictions, which economically freed up the colonists to produce and profit in North America. However, when the time came for England's government to benefit from its colonial exploits, 
England would impose heavy taxation and trade restrictions and regulations so as to extract resources and profit from its North American colonies. The best example of this break from salutary neglect and transition toward mercantilism was during the 18th century, after England had accrued enormous debt to its allies in conflicts such as the War of the Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War. This change in economic policy led directly to the American Revolution in the 1770s. Both the English and the Dutch also used joint stock companies, which were companies that involved numerous private investors who pooled financial resources to pursue an economic venture, such as monopolizing the spice trade in Southeast Asia or the tea trade in India, in which those private investors would both share loss and profit. Joint stocks, such as Dutch VOC and the British East India Company, were protected by their respective governments and were granted immense authority when it came to economic policy in distant lands. European religious motives complemented economic motives for exploration and expansion. European cultural traditions were transported to coastal West Africa, the Philippines, and the American colonies as Europeans established their transoceanic empires. However, the diffusion of cultural traditions, such as the Christian religion, resulted in the use of religion to pacify and control native peoples. This was especially true in the case of the Latin American colonies that were maintained by the Spanish and the Portuguese. Catholicism, which had been facing a great challenge during the 16th and early 17th centuries with the popularity of Protestantism, was a unifying cultural force of the diverse peoples of Latin America. Conquistadors like Hernando Cortes viewed the native practices of bloodletting, human sacrifice, polytheism, and idolatry as barbaric and godless ways. They went to great lengths to outlaw those types of practices, even if it meant using force and violence. The Jesuits were the most aggressive Catholic missionaries of the time, and they would aggressively convert Native Americans to Catholicism and help to stamp out their Native practices. Over time, strong Catholic communities included Mestizo and Native American populations, and in current-day Mexico City is the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which was established during the colonial period as more and more Native and Mestizo peoples were drawn to Catholicism. In the Latin American colonies, there was very little room for religious tolerance and coexistence. What little room that was allocated for Native Americans to retain their religious traditions was done in secrecy, under the threat of torture and execution if caught by Catholic colonists. Therefore, Spanish and Portuguese forcefulness and expectations of religious conformity was the applied method when it came to maintaining social order within the Latin American colonies. Between 1450 and 1648, Europe was experiencing its first round of global cultural diffusion, as well as its first round of global economic dominance. As European nations established commercial networks among Africa, Asia, and the Americas, the world entered into an unprecedented amount of exchange in goods, flora, fauna, and disease. That exchange, known as the Columbian Exchange, led to great demographic and economic benefit for European societies, which ultimately began the shift toward European economic dominance. Europeans introduced a variety of new plants and animals into the Americas, such as wheat, cattle, horses, pigs, and sheep. Additionally, Europeans introduced lethal diseases, such as smallpox and measles which facilitated European subjugation and destruction of indigenous peoples in the Americas. From the Americas, Europeans were introduced to new plants and animals such as tomatoes, potatoes, squash, corn, tobacco, and turkeys. Potatoes and corn became common staple crops in European diets, which helped to increase populations over the duration of the early modern period. By the beginning of the 18th century, Transatlantic African slave labor had become the most dominant form of coercive labor in the European maritime empires in the Western Hemisphere. 
In many ways, Europeans tapped into pre-existing African labor systems and then altered and intensified the patterns and volumes of African slavery. Slavery and dependency was innate in African culture, as it had been a big part of post-classical African and Mediterranean societies. Beyond that, pre-modern African slavery had included the exportation of African slaves out of North and East Africa into Southwest and South Asian societies. As Europeans, such as the Portuguese, arrived in coastal West Africa, African states and kingdoms began to actively engage in the slave trade with European slavers. African slave raiding became commonplace for powerful West African kingdoms, such as Congo and Ashanti, to utilize their strong positions over weaker, lesser politically developed African societies. These powerful West African states became dependent on gunpowder and other manufactured goods from Europe, and it was those European firearms which were exchanged for African captives that enabled these powerful West African states to continuously enact slave raids against vulnerable societies within the region. Europeans found that African males were better suited for plantation and mining work than Native Americans, as Native Americans had no real experience in deep mining and commercial agriculture that many West Africans experienced. Additionally, Native American labor was not suitable for plantation and mining work because of their inability to fend off diseases that were introduced into the Western Hemisphere via the Columbian Exchange. West Africa's seemingly endless source of slaves, its proximity to Europe, the Caribbean, and North and South America, garnered efficient transport of slaves across the Atlantic Ocean as part of the triangular trade. The lengthy step-by-step -step process of transatlantic slavery became an efficient and voluminous process, and it is important for students of history to recognize that every step in the process was intentional, purposeful, and methodical. Initial steps in the transatlantic slave trade included the slave raids led by powerful West African kingdoms, such as Congo and Ashanti. These types of kingdoms preyed on smaller, more vulnerable West African villages that existed inland. Captured Africans would be transported by the raid party to the coastline of West Africa. Some African captives were kept in barracoons, which were canopy shelters in which African captives were chained to while awaiting European slave ships to arrive. In fact, many barracoons were owned by Africans and eventually some would be owned by Europeans as more and more Europeans arrived in coastal West Africa. African captives were traded to Europeans for European manufactured goods, mostly weaponry, such as firearms. The captives were then placed in the cargo holds of large European slave vessels. These cargo holds were tightly packed with as many slaves that could possibly fit into the ships. Next, the slave ships set sail across the Middle Passage, which was the long, arduous journey of Africans to the Western Hemisphere. Many African slaves died en route to the New World, and some historians of African slavery estimate that approximately 4 million captives died before ever reaching the Western Hemisphere and being sold into slavery. Many African slaves attempted mutinies aboard European slave ships but few ever succeeded. Most slaver ships headed for the Caribbean and South America, specifically English Barbados, Spanish Cuba, French San Dominique, and Portuguese Brazil. Once in the Western Hemisphere, Africans were sent to slave auctions to be auctioned off to plantation and mine owners throughout the New World. Africans were dipped in grease so as to make their appearance healthy and physically fit that they would be auctioned. Finally, slaves were moved to their respective plantation or mine to carry out the difficult labor of the European maritime empires of the Western Hemisphere. Ultimately, transatlantic slavery had multi-regional consequences, but in terms of Europe, 
European society's increasing demands for Western hemispheric crops were met due to the productivity of African slavery during the early modern period. Additionally, the European control of global trade increased drastically due to their domineering role in the African slave trade. Thus, the material well-being of Europeans increased over time due to the volume and productivity of African slaves in the European maritime empires in the Americas. Europe's first round of global economic dominance between 1450 and 1648 garnered great economic benefit for all walks of European society. Innovations in banking and finance promoted the growth of urban financial centers and a money economy within European societies. For example, Italian merchants began utilizing double-entry bookkeeping so as to keep accurate accounts of their debit and credit histories. This practice enabled a greater frequency of money lending and purchases, which enabled greater market activity. Furthermore, commercial activity increased with the rise of private investment companies, specifically joint stock companies, such as the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. These companies enabled entrepreneurs to invest their money in long-distance ventures, such as spices, cotton, pepper, and tea, in hopes of jointly shared returns of profit. These companies were also fail-safe when it came to financial loss, as the losses were also shared jointly among investors. This commercial revolution sparked the rise of Europe's bourgeoisie, a new class of economic elites whose wealth was not necessarily based on land ownership, as in the case of Europe's nobility, but rather whose wealth was based on the amount of financial capital an individual owned. Europe's establishment of planter societies throughout the Americas also helped to alter the agricultural practices within European societies. Within Europe, agriculture became more commercialized than ever before. Just as commercial plantations in the Americas were needed to produce to meet global growing demands, agriculture in Europe would need to be altered to meet those global growing demands. The feudal practices of village commons and manors were beginning to be outdated as they were deemed to be underproductive compared to the commercial plantations abroad. Additionally, archaic labor systems, such as European serfdom, was deemed underproductive, since surplus was mainly enjoyed by the nobility, while the laborers merely retained subsistent levels of production. In some parts of Europe, such as England, enclosure movements began, which led to the privatization of village commons and other communal farmland. The purpose of the enclosure movement was to increase the productivity of these lands so that those who invested in these lands could earn large profits from increased productivity. Consider the consequences of Europe's age of discovery. Did its benefits reach every level of European society? Did its negative consequences reach every level of European society? Did a more commercialized and productive Europe make Europe a place of prosperity, stability, and tranquility? Or did it exacerbate issues of inequality and cultural difference?